Hello and welcome my dear friends and colleagues. This is the second part on the lecture series on aligning with astigmatism. In this segment we will address the pros and cons of incisional correction of astigmatism and our preferred technique of working up a case for toric IOL implantation while factoring in the posterior corneal toracity as well. I would strongly recommend that it would be a good idea for you to watch the presentation on part 1 of Align with Astigmatism published by FacoPoint as well as to go through the lecture on understanding the Baylor's nomogram before viewing this section. Although in this presentation I incorporate the Baylor's nomogram with a mention, I do not attempt to explain it in full as it has already been done. So let's get started. At the outset, we need to understand that full thickness incisions on the cornea, limbus or sclera and partial thickness cuts in the form of either radial or transverse keratotomies as well as circumferential limbal relaxing incisions will all produce a flattening effect. Now while radial incisions will produce a uniform flattening of all the corneal meridia like radial keratotomies, transverse or circumferential incisions or cuts like the clear corneal incision as well as the limbal relaxing incisions will produce a flattening on the meridian in which they are placed and it will produce a steepening of the meridian which is 90 degree away. Now this phenomenon is called coupling and the effectivity of the induced flattening of these procedures is expressed as a flattening to steepening ratio and this is known as the coupling ratio. If a transverse keratotomy produced say 0.5 diopters of flattening in the steep meridian and 0.5 diopters of steepening in the flat meridian then the coupling ratio in this case would be 1 is to 1 and the total coupling effect is 1 diopter. Since any type of incision on the cornea will produce a flattening effect, it is therefore important for us to know before we embark on any incisional correction on the cornea what the steep meridian is. Knowing the steep meridian is important therefore and it is important for us to remember that the plus cylinder axis on refraction generally represents the steep meridian of the cornea while the minus cylinder axis on refraction represents the flat meridian. One way to combat small amounts of pre-existing corneal astigmatism during cataract surgery is to place the incisions on the steep corneal meridian. Now this effect will produce what is known as a surgically induced astigmatism which is nothing but a flattening effect which will neutralize up to 0.5 diopters of pre-existing corneal astigmatism. Now the other option in case the astigmatism is more than 0.5 diopters is to create two clear corneal incisions in the same meridian. So if the magnitude for instance is up to 1 diopter we can use these paired corneal incisions or opposite corneal incisions. For instance if the corneal astigmatism of 1 diopter is in the 130 degree meridian two clear corneal incisions are made at 130 and 310 degrees. However, remember that it may not always be practical in all cases to place on axis incisions and this may even compromise on surgical comfort while performing the procedure and hence it seems like a good idea to comfortably place the clear corneal incision at your usual location and then try to combat astigmatism either with the help of limbal relaxing cuts uh, for smaller amounts of astigmatism or to simply implant a toric intraocular lens. The limbal relaxing incisions are either single or paired curvilinear incisions made in the extreme periphery of the cornea just anterior to the palisades of fork usually to a depth of about 90% of the peripheral corneal thickness. For performing limbal relaxing incisions one can either use a 600 micron or 550 micron guarded depth blades which could either have a blunt tip or a sharp tip. The blunt tip gives a much better cut than a sharp tip does. 
or you can use a diamond blade which has a micrometer setting. Basically, there are two nomograms that are used to calculate the amount of correction while performing limit relaxing incisions. These are the most widespread in use. They are the Nicheman nomogram and the Donenfield nomogram. The Nicheman nomogram requires the measurement of peripheral corneal thickness. And if you do not have access to it, then you can just go ahead and use the Donenfield's nomogram which recommends that the limbal relaxing incisions be performed with the 600 micron guarded depth blades. Now it is actually very simple in, to calculate the amount of correction that can be made. You can take the help of the LRI calculator. The LRI calculator can be easily accessed by simply typing it on the Google search bar. Now this site is a free use site maintained by a Johnson & Johnson company. Now after entering the patient details, we can choose between the Donenfield or the Nicheman nomogram. Now enter the relevant details about the patient's astigmatism and the correction will be displayed either in degrees or clock hours. Now the Napa nomogram corrects from 0.75 diopters to 3 diopters while the Don and Field nomogram corrects from 0.5 diopters to 3 diopters. So if you want to correct astigmatism lesser than 0.75 diopters, then you should use the Don and Fields nomogram. In both these nomograms, the maximum length of cut allowed is 90 degrees or 3 clock hours. You can't go more than this. This length of LRA will correct about one and a half diopters of astigmatism according to the assumptions made in these nomograms. The Don and Field nomogram does not allow for the LRI incisions to be carried across the main clear corneal incision or the side port incisions and should have a buffer of at least 10 degrees from the LRI incision. Whereas the Napa nomogram allows for the LRI incisions to overlap the clear corneal incisions. In such cases, the limbal relaxing incisions are created first, which is to a depth of say 90% of the peripheral corneal thickness, the clear corneal phaco incision is then created through this LRI incision at the desired axis. Now let's take this example for a two diopters of pre-existing corneal astigmatism at 150 degrees. The Donenfield nomogram suggests a 85 degree or an almost three clock hours of correction. One clock hour is equal to 30 degrees. With respect to limbal relaxing incisions, the younger the patient, the more the correction. For instance, a 30 year old patient will need about 10 degree or more correction than a 60 year old. Now using the same parameters as in the previous case, the same vector and magnitude of astigmatism, if we were to calculate the correction using the Napa nomogram, it suggests that paired LRA incisions may be made which can overlap the main clear corneal incision. The nomogram suggests that you use the Napa overlap technique as described earlier which is that you first create the LRI and then you fashion the clear corneal incision through the limbal relaxing cuts. The disadvantage of limbal relaxing incisions generally is that there seems to occur a certain degree of regression over a period of time and the initial good results tend to diminish with the passage of time. And hence, toric intraocular lenses remain the most predictable way of correcting pre-existing regular corneal astigmatism. Now they may be offered to patients with um, 0.75 diopters or more of against the rule astigmatism and 1.5 diopters or more of with the rule astigmatism as measured on the anterior corneal surface. Now the reason for this discrepancy is due to the presence of up to 0.3 to 0.5 diopters of against the rule posterior corneal toracity, which is clearly explained by Dr. Douglas Koch in his Baylor's nomogram for toric IOLs. The decoding and the interpretation of the Baylor's nomogram has already been presented by Facopoint in another PowerPoint lecture series. Kindly refer to it for a better understanding of the same. Now it has been estimated that about 30% of the cataractus population 
have a pre-existing corneal astigmatism of one diopter or more and since the majority of astigmatism in this group is of the against the rule variety today we tend to offer or we would like to offer toric intraocular lenses to a greater subset of cataractus patients than ever before unlike other premium intraocular lenses toric intraocular lenses are truly unique because failure to implant them when indicated will affect the unaided visual quality at all distances the toric iol success depends on two factors namely the accuracy and data acquisition and the precision of axis alignment during the surgical procedure the most important data we need for implanting the toric intraocular lenses are the correct magnitude and the vector of corneal astigmatism the refractive astigmatism is not important as it takes into account the lenticular astigmatism and as well and since the lens will be removed during cataract surgery this should not be taken into account although rarely some patients possess a small degree of retinal astigmatism this is difficult to determine and hence ignored in order to hit the bullseye with these two metrics namely the vector and the magnitude dr warren hill suggests using three independent measuring devices to obtain these values to look for a concurrence of these values he terms this as the triangle of agreement which is a term borrowed from aviation jargon now these measuring devices are labeled as a primary secondary and tertiary instruments in order of importance and weightage given to them in obtaining that particular data for example in ascertaining the magnitude of astigmatism the primary instrument is a well calibrated manual keratometer the secondary instrument could be either an auto k or k values obtained from optical biometry systems and finally the tertiary instrument being the topographer with respect to the vector the primary device is a topography based instrument or value as this will clearly differentiate between regular or orthogonal and irregular or non orthogonal astigmatism the secondary instrument is either the optical k or the auto k device and finally the tertiary instrument is the manual keratometer the triangle of agreement will determine that these three values taken from these three instruments should be in concordance for the particular value to be absolutely exact so this will ensure a greater level of success while implanting toric intraocular lens this is a concept that was described by dr warren hill now with respect to calculation of the toric iol power the axis of placement and the model and type of the toric iol that needs to be implanted i believe that the best that is available in the market today is the barrett's online toric calculator the barrett's online calculator is one of the most predictable calculators for toric iol power model and axis of placement because this calculator takes into account the posterior corneal toricity as well it takes into account the depth factor of the anterior chamber which will affect the change in the toric power from the corneal to the iol plane so what you need to do first is to calculate the spherical equivalent of the iol power now this is done using standard biometry techniques using the formula of your choice this formula could be dependent on the axial length like using a half a q for short eyes or the srkt for longer axial lengths or you can simply use the barrett's universal formula in order to calculate the spherical equivalent what you see on the screen is the barrett's toric calculator that has been taken from the ascrs site now let's see how we navigate through this toric calculator the first thing is that you need to accept the terms and conditions for using the toric calculator After clicking on the patient data icon, start by entering the patient details like the patient's flat K and steep K and the calculated spherical equivalent intraocular lens power that you have calculated. Under keratometric index, use 
a value of 1.3375. Now this is for all instruments that measures the K value based on the anterior corneal surface. If you know the lens factor, you can enter it here or you simply enter the A constant value for the intraocular lens of your choice. Now enter all the relevant details in all the boxes that are given. However, the lens thickness values and the white to white measurements are not mandatory. Now, please remember that under surgically induced astigmatism, it is a common practice for us to enter a value of 0.5 diopters. Now, according to Dr. Barrett, he points out that this may be a little bit of overkill and he has calculated that the average centroid value for SIA in most hands is only about 0.2. So, in order to get better postoperative results in your cases, it is a good idea to enter a value of just 0.2 under SIA instead of 0.5. Under the pop-up menu, kindly choose the toric IOL type and design that you intend to implant. If you are planning to use an indigenous intraocular lens which is not listed here, then you can simply choose the personalized constant and enter the personalized A constant. And you can choose the design or model that most closely resembles the indigenous toric IOL that you are about to implant. Once all the details have been entered by you in the relevant boxes, then you have to click the calculate button. But before you do that, you have to choose something known as predicted PCA or measured PCA. What is this? It simply means the posterior corneal astigmatism. Since we have not measured the posterior corneal astigmatism, we can choose the predicted PCA values. In case you have access to instruments that can measure the posterior corneal toricity and astigmatism, then you can actually enter the measured PCA values. Now the entered values will now be visible on the eye diagram in the lower right hand corner of the printout. Please look at the eye diagram very carefully and see if all the details that you have entered is carefully represented in the eye diagram. After verifying that the details are accurate and precise, what you have to do next is to click on the toric IOL button. This will then suggest the IOL model and design as well as the axis of placement. This is the final calculation sheet and you can either print it or save it as an image for reference when you go about implanting the toric intraocular lens. The printout will also show you the expected residual refraction etc. The second important determinant for success is how to execute an impeccable surgical toric IOL implantation surgery. Of course, this will include an accurate marking of the axis of placement as well as the incision site. In my case, I marked the site of incision and the axis of placement marks without creating the reference marks at 0 and 180 degrees using radial marks made with a hockey stick blade. I call this the direct radial toric marking system. This has already been presented by me in the past. This concludes the lecture series on aligning with astigmatism. We hope you have found it useful. I thank you all for your very patient hearing.